Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm so glad you did. I have to be honest, I don't know where I'd be without you. <laughs> so glad to have Dr. Glenn Pickering here in studio with me. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe this is in, you've heard this in your own head. Oh no, we're having this argument again. <laughs> Maybe you've said it out loud. Either way, it's kind of a bummer because it sounds like then you're having a repeated unresolved argument. And if that's what you're doing, I'm pretty sure that's pretty destructive because you're going to end up saying things that are tough and hurtful and painful. I think we can put a stop to that uh, as early as today. (laughs) I think Glenn's going to help us do that. Glenn is not only a uh, counselor, but he's a um, psychologist and uh, also does a lot of teaching seminars, all kinds of good work. You can learn more about him at drglennpickering.com. That's Glenn with two N's, G L E. N N P I C K E R I N G Glenn Dr Glenn Pickering dot com Glenn welcome thank you it's always great to be here yeah you? so you're sitting in your office and people come in and they're you're, you're you're thinking you're having the same argument over and over and over right how do you break this pattern that's a really great question so let's start right there sometimes people are like well so what that's normal isn't it and I'm like no see that's really wrong thinking we need to understand just like you said a second ago, that that's destructive. Mm -hmm. Because if we sort of take that for granted, or if we just think, well, that's just how it is if you're married, or that's just how it is, we not only don't change it, we even don't see the need to change it. So I just want to spend a few minutes just sort of outlining why do we need to change that? Like, what's the downside of that? Not because I want to be some big bummer. (laughs) but I just think, but it is important that we just acknowledge why would we bother changing that? So I want to start here. Um, so and the first thing is a lot like what you just said. When we have one of those repeated arguments over and over again, we start saying things that are harsh or that are mean-spirited or that are literally meant to be hurtful. And um, and I love when it says in James 3, you know, you use the same tongue that you use to bless God to curse the people in your life who are made in the image of God. That That can't be right. I mean, there's something just fundamentally wrong that the same person who would use their tongue to praise God would use that same tongue to curse the people that God made and who God adores. So it's wrong just in the present. Like what happens right in that moment is already like wrong or hurtful from a very scriptural perspective. Um, but but it's wrong for the future too because, you know, like for example, I'll just make it concrete so we can kind of be clear. My wife Gwen and I, when we were first married, we used to have terrible conversations about money. And I would always walk away thinking she thinks I don't make enough money. She would always walk away thinking Glenn thinks I'm just a spendthrift. And neither one of us actually thought that about the other one, of course. But that's how we both walked away feeling, like I'm the bad one, this is my fault, all those icky feelings. So now, and because it was left unresolved, because we immediately went to that tag playing place instead of trying to resolve the financial question that was in front of us, whatever that was, Now, next time we have to talk about anything that involves money, see, we bring those old feelings to that next conversation. So Gwen already walks in defensive thinking, I think she's a spendthrift. I walk in defensive already thinking she thinks I don't make enough money. And we are literally having a conversation, a bad conversation before we even start talking. And some people say, Glenn, that's not possible. You can't have a bad conversation before you start talking. No, you actually can't. We're literally getting set in our mind, expecting to be defensive. We come in expecting that we need to defend ourselves, and we are guaranteed to have a bad conversation. So if we have one of those conversations that end in that bad, unresolved, somebody feels bad about themselves place, we are literally set up not just to walk away feeling bad that day. We're literally set up now to have the next bad conversation about that same topic because the next time we try and talk about it, we come in with that attitude, with that defensiveness, without expecting things to go badly. And, of course, they do because they would almost have to because there's no place in there for God's grace to work on us or to change us in any way. So, so having those bad conversations is bad in the present because we say stuff that James says we shouldn't be saying to each other. But it's also bad in the long run, both short-term and near-term. In the short-term, I'm way more... You know, next time we had the conversation, 
likely to have a bad conversation. But it's also bad long term because pretty soon we start avoiding having those conversations. Well, if we're avoiding having any conversation about money, for example, guess what else we have to avoid? Each other. Each other, because any conversation could turn into something that might involve money at some point. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about the simplest thing. Hey, do you think we should send Rachel to Spanish camp this year? I don't know. What's it cost? Oh, no. (laughs) See, we're we're already having a bad conversation about that. Mm -hmm. It's like, so, um, and the word sin literally means separate. And so if we let ourselves get into that pattern where we have those repeated arguments over and over again, so we start avoiding each other, not just in the short term, but in the long term, avoiding each other altogether, we're living more and more and more in a state of sin. Which again, I don't mean judgmentally. Some people hear that word like a condemnation. No, it's just that it's a description. We're living in a state of being disconnected from one another, not being one. And that is really, really hurtful to any relationship. So we need to understand We let ourselves get pulled into that conversation. We're hurting that person right now, and we're hurting the relationship short-term and long-term to the point where if we keep it up, it will literally destroy the relationship. Mm -hmm. Certainly had conversations with friends that will talk about some interaction they had in some kind of relationship, right? and their response was, (laughs) I'm never doing that again. Right, exactly. And boy, the wall goes up, and you realize that a lot of black and white behavior is happening, right? and... It's it's not building a bridge, is it, Glenn? No, it's doing the exact the opposite. Yeah. And one of the things that we see in nature, you know, if you start a rock rolling down a hill and you don't stop it, and not just it doesn't just keep going down the hill; it goes down the hill faster and faster. Mm-hmm. And once that avoidance thing starts, it not only gets worse, it gets worse faster and faster. And it's subtle at first, and then really, really not subtle. Mm-hmm. But you've got a whole lifetime, perhaps, or decades of experience with someone right and you understand how they operate how they think right. yep. and how do you even suspend that for five minutes if you're trying to listen in a fresh way i honestly don't think it's humanly possible okay. which is why it's really helpful to be christian in this state I mean, <laughs> in, in this kind of situation because yeah. one of the things Gwen and i found is to have any conversation about money, even if it was a short one, we beforehand, and I so bless Gwen for being willing to do this with me, we'd hold hands, we'd ask God to help us see the one, other one as they actually are, not as whatever bad image we had on our mind of them. Mm-hmm. We ask God to help us have a loving conversation, and the instant we could even just do one loving thing, we'd get up and go to something else. Because <laughs> we knew we probably could only do that for a little bit at a time. But... There was, still a, there was still a victory, and we would hold hands and we'd pray for each other. We'd thank each other afterwards. We'd thank God for helping us because we knew our own ego was not going to heal that wound. Mm-hmm. Boy, when you talk about the now and the future, Glenn, with yep. the future being more avoidance right. and the further you drift and apart, the absolute worse it's going to be. And right. I would imagine this is a template for other areas of communication that's just right. going to make not only the money issue bad, right. but other things because you're establishing right. a new pattern right. of skirting around, avoiding. Yep. And I I love if I'm at a seminar because I can make a little concentric circles. So listeners, if you're listening, just think about concentric circles because sometimes people say, well, Glenn, there's one issue we just can't talk about. So we've agreed we just won't talk about topic A. I'm going to mm-hmm. pick money just because it's an easy one to think about. We just don't talk about money. So we have separate checking accounts. We do our money separately. We pay for things separately. So that way we never have to talk about money. Oh, uh-huh. But we very quickly find, oh, there's a whole bigger circle of topics around that one that are related to money that could lead there. Hey, we're going to send Rachel to the Spanish camp. Hey, this bed is getting really lumpy. Do we need to buy a new one? Hey, it's like there's so many topics now we can't bring up because it could lead to a talk, a conversation about money, which we can't do. So we start avoiding all those topics. Yeah. Well, then there's another concentric circle outside of that one. Hey, like, so I saw a friend of mine got a new chair. Oh, that reminds me of the bed. Oh, the bed is lumpy. Oh, we need that's about money. I mean, it's like, it's like those, we just realized eventually they start to become this incredibly long list of things we can't talk about. And pretty soon we're only talking about the weather or the Minnesota Twins' lack of starting pitching. So, yeah, so that, that avoidance thing just literally starts to take over the relationship. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the now part of this, you're going to, possibly say something that you're going to wish she took back or right. you're going to out of frustration say something that you're going to think oh i guess that was hurtful yeah i should not have said that i'm going to look back and think oh crud what was i thinking yeah mm. so 
Dr. Glenn Pickering is my guest. We're talking about having this same argument again. Are, are, are you in a relationship where the, you're having an unresolved, repeatable argument that you you, you never seem to get break the cycle of? And Glenn, you've said before that we have maybe one argument our whole life. Right. It, it's, is over is the argument who's again. right and who's wrong? Right. Is that yeah. kind of the argument? We just don't want to be the bad one. It all comes back to the game of tag. Yeah. And so, so I understand now when people say, well, we can't talk about kids, money, sex, in-laws, doesn't matter. It's not that that topic is hard. It's that that topic, as soon as we start talking about it, we switch over to playing tag about it instead. Mm-hmm. So it's not that we can't talk about money. It's that we never stay on that topic. We immediately go to, oh, you think I'm not good enough. You think I spend too much. Like, we're not even talking about money. We're just talking about whose fault is this? Mm-hmm. The whole game of tag. And that's the one argument people and that's the argument that can't just, break out of. Yeah, that's the one we just keep having over and over again. I hope there's some guidance along this hour where you can help us change how we do this. I will be so glad to do that. Would you? Yeah. Awesome. If All you right. have a question or comment, let me know what it is. I'll ask Glenn on your behalf. 877-933-2484. Dr. Glenn Pickering is my guest. You can learn more about him at drglennpickering.com. It's got a little ring to it, doesn't it? Drglennpickering.com. We'll be right back. I love it. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. Or you might be more like the person that goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. The good news is, is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a really nice little coffee shop not far from the Eiffel Tower that serves a really nice chocolate biscotti. Welcome back to the show. So glad to have Dr. Glenn Pickering as my guest. I'm not we're, that funny. No, no, we're <laughs> we're trying to break in some new bumper music, and we didn't know there were we didn't know there were vocals in that one. We like to stick just to instrumental, and that kind of surprised Rosie and me. So that's why we chuckled. A very fun moment. All right. Yeah. So we're talking to uh, Dr. Glenn Pickering today about unresolved and repeated arguments, and they're destructive. Basically, we all have one argument that we argue over and over and over, and that is who's right and who's wrong. Yeah, who's and at fault? Who's, who's at fault? Who's the bad one? Who's the, who's the blame? Exactly. And we talked at the first part of the show about why that's bad for the relationship that you're in. I just want to talk for a minute. Again, don't want to be negative. I just want people to understand why this is so important. Um, if you have kids, see, it's really hurtful to them too. And I want to talk about a couple of reasons why that's true. And the first one is they don't develop any conflict resolution skills. You know, kids, um, a friend of mine, Steve, used to teach parenting classes, and somebody asked them, you know, they have a preteen, and they said, well, Steve, you know, the stuff you're teaching is great, but, you know, my kids don't even listen to me. They're preteens now. They don't listen to me. And Steve paused for a moment. I could see him sort of praying, and he said, you shouldn't worry about the fact that your kids never listen to you. You should worry about the fact that they're always watching you. <laughs> what a good point. I know, and I've thought about that like hundreds of times since then because it's so right. Mm-hmm. If you argue all the time in front of your kids and they think, oh, that's how you resolve an argument, except nothing ever gets resolved, of course, mm-hmm. but those are the skills that they learn, and that's what they're going to do in their relationship because that's what they saw you do. And so people talk about generational sin, and sometimes they talk about it in almost mystical sort of ways. And I think, no, we need to understand it is literal because remember, I said it a minute ago, sin just means separate. If kids watch their mom and dad have arguments in ways that separate them, they're going to have arguments when they grow up with other people in ways that separate them from those other people. And then the sin, the literal separation, where we're supposed to have union, continues on in the next generation. We literally learn it because we watch it and we see it and kids copy everything they do. Mm -hmm. I have a four-year-old granddaughter who has been reteaching me that you have to be really careful what you say and do around here because it will all get repeated. (laughs) <laughs> right. No matter what. Right. Because <laughs> so, they're always watching you. So if you have kids, that's one reason why it's so not helpful for them to see you have those arguments because they don't learn how to do it themselves. 
But there's also a second reason why that I think most parents don't really get. See, if your kids see you having those kind of arguments, they learn not to trust you. I see mom and dad arguing. It always goes real badly. Somebody always walks away from like the bad one. And now I have something I need to talk to mom and dad about that might make them unhappy or that they might disapprove of. What am I thinking to myself? How can I not have that conversation? I don't want to receive what they always receive from each other, that harshness, that judgment, that tag playing stuff where somebody walks away from them like the bad one. And so the parents of those kids say to me, well, Glenn, my kid keeps secrets. They're liars. They don't tell the truth. They give me monosyllable answers. They isolate themselves. How can I get them to quit doing that? And I think, well, before you figure out how to get them to quit doing that in the future, you probably need to ask yourself, why are they doing it now? Because if they thought it was safe to talk to you about those things, they would be. Because like I just said about my granddaughter, she doesn't hold anything back. She's utterly transparent. She'll mm-hmm. see whatever she saw or whatever she's thinking, she'll just tell you. So kids just naturally blurt out whatever's going on inside them. So if your kid is not talking to you, they are specifically choosing not to talk to you. It's really important to understand. That's not an accident. There's something they've seen in your behavior or a repeated pattern that makes them think it's not safe to tell you the truth. So they don't. And then they get labeled the, lab- the liar and the problem in the family. And I get it's a problem. But I think, yeah, but they are not the actual source of that problem. They're a symptom of it, but they're not actually the source of it. Because if they watch their parents go back and forth in those really destructive, repeated arguments that never get anywhere, and now I did something I think my mom might, or dad might be a little upset about, I'm not going to bring it up. And even if they ask me, I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> because I don't want to be in that conversation that I see them have. Mm-hmm. I know I'm just going to walk away feeling like the bad one myself. They're being trained in either no or bad conflict resolution. Right, exactly. I thought I call those kids secret agents. Because they've learned it's better to stay under the radar, keep my thoughts to myself, wear a nice mask, pretend to do everything mm-hmm. right, be pleasant, and just move on like I got nothing going on. Because I don't want anybody to ask me. And if you ask that kid, hey, how are you doing? Oh, fine. How about you? Like, <laughs> mm. They live their life like it's a secret because they learn, wow, when you tell the truth, that happens. Not going there. Wow. <laughs> that's That's gotten to be a big topic all of a sudden. Yeah? Tell me how that goes. Well, you grow up in a house where you discover that if you tell the truth you might get in trouble right therefore shut up right exactly yeah i will keep it to myself i'll keep secrets and if you ask me then i'll lie yeah because i I see where the truth gets you yeah so you get get punished for it maybe like literally or at least get in a really bad argument that you're going to walk away feeling like a really bad person because that's what happens when mom and dad are you so Who's going to volunteer for that? That's yep. a suicide mission. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I mean? Nobody's going there. Yeah. I appreciate that, including the kids in this discussion. almost feels like that could be a whole other hour. Honestly, it could, to yeah. be honest. Because, oh. I, you know, it says in Colossians 3, you know, uh, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And I think, see, for a kid, there's nothing as discouraging. And, that, and the data on this is clear. There's been tons of research. There's nothing that makes a kid as unhappy as seeing their parents argue. That's why I say that over again. There's nothing that makes your children as unhappy as seeing the two of you argue that makes them feel utterly unsafe. Mm-hmm. And so when it says, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged, see, if they see you do that, they do get discouraged because life feels sort of hopeless. Nothing ever gets resolved. It's not worth telling the truth. I have to keep everybody distant so nobody is mean to me. So they live a life with a sort of secret. They feel kind of isolated and they don't have any hope for the future. Well, that's discouraged. Yeah. That's what discouraged looks like. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally going directly against what it tells us in the Bible about not provoking our kids lest they become discouraged because when we interact like that in front of them, discouraged is how they become. Mm -hmm. Dr. Glenn Pickering is my guest. If you have a question or comment, I bet Glenn would answer your question. 877-933-2484. I always think of this truism, Glenn. What you're doing speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Uh Uh-huh. That's so true. So so when when kids are witnessing parents having no conflict resolution, raised voices, and you're realizing as a kid, I don't want to get in that arena. Right. And the only thing they learn from that is to be afraid of you. 
What do you mean? Well, like let's say I see my parents arguing. Their voices get loud. It gets mean. I not only don't trust that I can share my secrets with you and be safe, I actually am walking on things that I'm afraid of both of you because oh, I don't gotcha. know when you guys are going to explode. Gotcha. And so mm-hmm. kid, parents think their kids should respect me. And I think if they see you arguing, they actually are afraid of you. Yeah. So let's say you're 12 years old and you're feeling that way about your parents. Now yep. let's just add 20 years to 12. Carry the one, that's right. 32, right? <laughs> now you're a 32-year-old and you're still not talking. Right. Because you're afraid, right? Right. That doesn't go away. I know. I um, Then you're 62 and things still haven't changed. I know. So I just think, well, we'll talk more about healing of old patterns when we get a little further into the show, but um, I just think... Um, I talked about generational sin a second ago. Sometimes when people come to me for help, they say, well, God, I can see how the changes you're saying will make my life better. And I think it will make your life better. It will also make your kids' life better and your kids' kids. It will make the life better of people who are born when you're gone because generational goodness is also true. Mm, And everything I do to break the curses that have been handed to me so I can hand on something else to my kids will be handed to their kids and their kids and their kids. And so we need to understand we're not just in this battle for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're in this battle for literally everybody who comes after us, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. All right, Glenn, I know we're going to get into a lot more material in the second half of the show. We've got a couple minutes. Maybe you'd feel a a few questions I have. I'd love to do it. Yeah. What if you asked... What would you do in my shoes in a particular, uh, to a particular topic that's being avoided? So here's someone that is in a situation where a particular topic is being avoided. Then and they I, want to know what to do. I want to come to my partner and say, "Hun, I notice we never talk about X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. Notice, I notice we, we, not you, and notice we never talk about X, Y, or Z." What could we do to make it safe for us to talk about that topic? And when the person looks at you blankly, you might think about just what I talked about with Gwen, like holding hands, praying over each other ahead of time, listening carefully, repeating what the other person said instead of responding with your thoughts. What are the things we could do very specifically and concretely so that we could actually have a conversation about that topic that was loving instead of hurtful? Mm-hmm. Some risk there, right? Yeah, absolutely. No Some risk, risk, no reward. Right, but there's also no blame. No, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Always, always, always. I see we have that pattern. I'm wondering how we could do it. Like <laughs> maybe here's something maybe we could do differently together. Yeah. And it's so important that that be your mindset, not just your words, your actual thinking. We have to do this better. How does it work out, Glenn, when what you're saying sounds like blame? Because it is. <laughs> doesn't work out well, does it? <laughs> nope. Because the other person will feel then that and have this sort of knee-jerk defensive reaction and suddenly we're having one of those conversations. And, yeah, there's no upside to that one. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take a little break. Um, Dr. Glenn Pickering is my guest, and if you want to ask him a question, let me know, 877-933-2484. I don't know if you've downloaded the Faith Radio app. Go to your app store and check it out. I have to say it's a... It's a beautiful app. I've got mine on my iPhone. And uh, when you download it, you just can't believe how pretty it is. And you open it up, and it's uh, very easy to navigate your way through it. And you can listen to Faith Radio Live, or you can just uh, check out the podcast. It doesn't matter where you go. You can download if you've got that Faith Radio app. So give it a try. And if you don't like it, you know, it's easy just to delete it off your phone. But I'm pretty sure you'll keep it. argument again this, <laughs> this argument it seems like there's like one argument out there yep. and it's who's right and and who's who doesn't want to be wrong right, exactly. that right, Glenn? who's not the bad one who's yep. not the bad one right. yeah and that is the core of a lot of destructive uh, arguments right. and we're trying to 
figure out a way to navigate through this so we can change and break patterns. But in order to, to do that, Glenn, I think we first have to see it, don't we? It's so true that um, all of us grew up in families that have certain struggles, but because they had those struggles and that was our family, we think it's normal. We actually have to step back and think, oh, I get it. Yeah. This is really not how it's supposed to be. And not even meanly or cynically. I just really get we can We grew up in certain ways. We take that for granted. And then somebody like Glenn Pickering comes along and says, hey, if you have the same arguments over and over again, it's really destructive. It's bad for you and for the kids. And somebody says, oh, well, that's how everybody is. Like, no, it's not. I get that's how it always has been for you. It's not how it is. And so first we just have to be at that place where we can think, wow, this really isn't right. But again, see, I, we have to be careful about that because then we so often then go to condemnation. We just have to remember that there is no condemnation in Christ. When God shows me some part of my life that needs to be transformed, there's no judgment, there's no condemnation. The God who loves me, the steadfast love, loved me when I was making those mistakes, loves me now when I'm seeing that mistake, and will love me continually as I try and get better at not making that mistake. I mean, mm-hmm. that never changes. We just have to remember that so clearly. Otherwise, we just go to that shame place, and now we think we're the bad one. Well, that's not helpful. So it's important if you have these repeated arguments to just think, oh, I get it. We do this thing that's really, really, really not helpful to us. Right. I want you to see it clearly, literally without judgment, because that's how God sees it. Mm -hmm. Totally clearly, no judgment. So, Glenn, I can't change what I don't see? Right. Say more about that. Well, when we get convicted about something and God shows us a part of our life that has to change, we get, I think, what I talked about a second ago. We get total clarity with no condemnation. It's like, oh, I see that now. I see clearly, oh, right. Like God showed me a long time ago that I wasn't very welcoming to people, which was a little shocking to me, but I could see it was true. People would come over to my house, and I'd be so busy taking care of them, putting their coat away, you know, all the different things I could do to be helpful, that I didn't actually just stop long enough to let them know how happy I was to see them, how glad I was that they were there. <laughs> And God showed me, Glenn, you're so busy doing stuff when people come over, they don't actually feel welcomed in your house. And the instant I saw that through God's eyes, it's like, whoa, well, that has to change. You know what I mean? It's like I, once we see that through God's eyes, it's like, okay, I have to quit making excuses for it, rationalizing it, defending it, or pretending some okay. Because when I see it through God's eyes, I think, oh, oh, wow, that has to be different. Right. With no condemnation, just clarity, that has to be different. I want that to be different. So it's important to start with ourselves, and hopefully we see what God is trying to show us so that we can make small baby steps in doing things differently. Right. Even even that's what I was talking about with the parents with kids. If you feel like, well, my kid lies, they don't tell the truth, they isolate. It's easy to focus on that problem, and that is half of the problem. But we need to start with ourselves when Jesus said, why do you see that log in your, you know, see the speck in your brother's eye? Don't see the log in your own eye. We have to ask ourselves, is there anything I'm doing as a parent that would tend to encourage that sort of behavior? Again, not judgmentally. I just want God to show me whatever that might be so that I can see it clearly and then repent of that. Because I just really think there's no transformation without repentance. And some people have a lot of baggage about the word repentance and think that means that they're a bad person or that they're it or that everything's their fault or it's about shame somehow. And I think, no, it's not that. It just means I see clearly that there's a part of my life that needs transformation. That's all repentance means. Mm. I see honestly before myself and God that there's a part of my life that needs transformation. And I acknowledge that fully without any excuses or defending. I just think, yep, that's right. Glenn, it almost sounds like an engineering problem. And your engineering background would <laughs> suggest, <kind> of <laughs> you know, but, but in, a, in a way you're going, there's right. something that needs transforming. Right. And exactly. I think that's almost the way an engineer would speak. Right, sure. I get that. I mean, here's the solution that needs to happen. Right. And here's how to do it. I, I like that there's a, there's a plan. There's right. something you can start today. Right. I love that. That's a great way to think. I'm going to remember that you said that. Thank you. So when it says in Ezekiel 18, if we repent and then we get a new heart and a new spirit, and I think, right. That's what I mean about there's no transformation without repentance. Again, not judgment, just repentance, a clear seeing that there's a part of my life that needs to be transformed. Because I can't be transformed as long as I don't think there's a part of my life that needs to be transformed because God's not going to do anything unless I'm, my heart is open to receiving that. So if I want God to transform my life, I have to be open to being transformed, which means first I have to acknowledge there's a part of my life that needs to be transformed. 
So, Glenn, if I've been unjustly hurt by somebody, Mm -hmm. they weren't loving, they weren't caring, they misunderstood me, and I feel very wounded, how long will I hold on to that? That's a really great question. And one of the things I, you know, we were talking before the show about all the times I've been having flashbacks today and more constantly lately as God brings up healing stuff for me. So for me, it starts with accepting or just acknowledging that happened. And that was hurtful. I had a client a long time ago, a young guy, who said, well, Glenn, you know, my dad was abusive to me growing up. But, you know, he, had, he was abused himself, so that's how it was. So I need to forgive him. I, no, no, no. See, you're pretending nothing bad happened to you and that you need to forgive it. But see, I can't forgive something that didn't actually happen. I have to acknowledge, yes, my dad was hurt, he was broken, and he took that out of me and was hurtful to me in these following ways. And I choose to forgive that hurt. But first I have to admit the part that got hurt. Otherwise I'm forgiving something I'm pretending didn't happen. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Same with repentance. If Mm -hmm. I'm seeking somebody else's forgiveness for a hurtful thing I might have done, first I have to admit that I did that and I see that it was hurtful. So let's say this client had a dad that was very hurtful, but his response to you is, well, Glenn, I mean, he, he was doing the best he could. I'm going to say, yes, that's probably true, and it was still hurtful to you. So okay. we can claim it was hurtful to you. We don't have to bash your dad. We don't have to make him the bad one. We don't have to play tag. We just have to acknowledge the things he did were hurtful to you, mm-hmm. period. We don't have to be mean to him. We just have to claim the truth because the truth does set us free. And he did things that were hurtful to you, and there's a freedom that just stands in saying, yes, that happened. Because otherwise I'm trying to forgive something I'm pretending didn't happen. It, it literally doesn't work. Yeah. But I would imagine that comes up often. Oh, for sure. Because you, at the end of the day, deeply love a parent. Right. And there was abuse or alcoholism or mm-hmm. something. You were ignored, whatever. Right. But deep down, you still want to love your parents. So Absolutely. you say, well, he was doing the best he could. And you're suggesting that you can say, yes, that is a possibility that he did do the best he could. And... And right. you got hurt. Right, and you still got hurt. And you got hurt. And it's just important. That's why some people say, well, I don't want to speak badly about my parents. And you don't have to. If I go to an AA meeting and I come home and my wife says, hey, how'd the meeting go? I don't get to talk about anybody else. But I can talk about what I learned. Hey, this was helpful to me. Here's how it impacted me. Here's what I learned. Here's what was helpful. Or here's what was kind of hurtful. Well, it's the same thing. We don't have to bash anybody else to talk about the things that happened in our life that were hurtful to us. We don't have to make anybody else a demon. We just have to say, this happened, and it hurt me in this way. I learned not to talk. I learned to keep things to myself. And now I really struggle with that, and so I'm having to learn how to speak up. Right. That's just true. It's not bashing. It's not mean-spirited. It's just true. Mm-hmm. All right, Glenn, here's another question. I have a Great. supervisor that will not listen to me. Mm. As soon as I start talking, she will interrupt me. Any suggestions? Uh... Well, we're all going to have a knee-jerk reaction to that, which is, I'm just going to quit talking to my supervisor. (laughs) Which, you know, when you were saying before in the show, earlier in the show today, you said about, well, I'm just not going to go there again. I think, right, that is always our knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. And, And I need to give that one some prayerful thought, because that might actually be the true answer. But it's also possible that I need to talk to my supervisor and say, hey, every time we have an interaction... I walk away feeling bad, and I wonder if we can do that differently. Again, just like with my partner, I'm going to invite them into the process to see if we can do that differently, because they might not even know what's happening. Right. And if they're doing that, and then I shut down and get all quiet, see, we're each keeping that thing going. And me speaking up and saying, you know, maybe we can find a different way to do that is me no longer doing my half of keeping that icky pattern going. Mm Mm-hmm. And if they're open to it, that's great. If they're not, then maybe I start looking for a different job. But I want to find out first whether they would be open to doing that differently. Mm. We often carry on parallel monologues, don't we? We just so do, in fact. (laughs) And if I'm your supervisor, I get to speak up when I want to. Right. But if you're a good supervisor, you're going to listen to everything somebody says to you. Yes. I uh, had a client one time who had just been promoted to an executive position. He said, Glenn, should I try and build up good relationships with the people who report to me, or should I just have real high standards? And I think... If you build those really great relationships with people, they will want to live up to those high standards. Mm -hmm. That's not an either or. (laughs) So Glenn Pickering is my my Mm -hmm. guest. We're talking about uh, 
having that same argument again? And there are two most common sources of our patterns, Glenn. So let's talk about these patterns. Okay, cool. The first one, people have heard me talk about this before who've been listening in for you for all these years. Um, we play tag. We just don't want to be the bad one. So an argument starts. We translate that in our head, not to you disagree with me or you have a different viewpoint or there's another way to think about it. We translate that into our heads to, oh, so you think it's my fault. You think I'm the bad one. You, It's like, wow. And we translate that so fast that we might not even realize we're translating. Mm-hmm. If Gwen says, hey, honey, I can't find that check that you sent out. See, if I'm not translating, I simply hear a statement. Gwen can't find a check. <laughs> if I translate, which we do if we're not careful, I think, oh, so you think I'm sloppy and I can't find anything. I throw things away. I'm messy. And she looks at me like, what just happened? Mm-hmm. But if we're not careful, we assume, we, we interpret, we make that mean something where it probably was just a question or a piece of information or a fact that they're sharing, and we make that into something where we're being criticized or attacked where we have to defend ourselves, and now we're going to be having one of those conversations. Because all it takes is one of us to get triggered to, for us to start having that conversation. So Gwen said, I can't find the check you sent out. And I said, oh, so you think I'm messy, I'm sloppy, you can't trust me, is that what you're saying? And she starts getting, I didn't say that. I just, you know, we're having that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to be the bad one, do you? I know, because we just don't want to be the bad one. Yeah. But we need to understand in our little human ways that mostly when people are talking to us, that's not what, that's not the conversation they're trying to have. But we go there so fast if we're not careful. Yeah, we can be odd at times, can't we, Glenn? Oh, my goodness sakes. We're a funny little group of people. <laughs> All right, so uh, not to be the bad one, and that would be the game of tag, which you have spoken about so eloquently on the program. And uh, just because we're bringing up tag and we're right up against the break, maybe just give me a a 60-second understanding of tag again. Okay, tag is a game we get into when we're not actually trying to be right, although it looks like that in the argument. We're just trying not to be wrong. Just like in the game of tag, the goal is just to not be it. Was it my fault, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm not it. I'm not the bad one. I didn't do that. You never sent me the email. You never blah, blah, blah. It's always somebody else's fault. And um, instead of just thinking, oh, okay. Well, I probably was half of that little interaction that went badly, and how are we going to do that differently? Mm-hmm. We're going instead to whose fault it is, and suddenly we're having one of those conversations. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about becoming a second responder. So we're going to find out what that means from Dr. Glenn Pickering. He's my guest this hour. We're talking about we're having this argument again about repeated unresolved arguments. They are destructive. And we're going to try to get you to change your patterns with some fresh ideas coming up. If you want to learn more about Glenn, go to drglennpickering.com. We'll be right back. Hi there and welcome. If you are a new listener, we want to officially welcome you with a free welcome packet gift. Request yours today at MyFaithRadio.com. We're back with Dr. Glenn Pickering and we're talking about having that same argument again. You're in it repeated unresolved argument we're trying to break you out of that today two of the most common sources of our patterns are what glenn called tag you don't want to be the bad one and the other one is uh, becoming a second responder glenn what does that mean well those actually go together so let's talk about it okay um so um well we don't want to be it we don't want to get tagged we don't want to be the bad one if we're not careful, then we just respond defensively as soon as somebody's upset with us. And I know for years, Gwen could say to me, hey, the thing you just said hurt my feelings. And I would just start talking. So all my reactions were knee-jerk reactions. Well, I was just being funny. You shouldn't take it so seriously. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my gosh. Defending, 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 blah, blah, blah. But see, when we get triggered in that game of tape, which is a fearful game, we're afraid of being the bad one, afraid of being it. And fear makes us really self-centered. doesn't mean we're self-centered people. It means when we're caught up in fear, we're so busy protecting ourselves, we not only don't take care of the other person in the conversation, we don't even actually see them. 
we see a gigantic pain in our neck or a problem or source of irritation, but we don't see them. Mm. If that makes any sense. It does. And so if I'm going to become a second responder, that means I have to find a way to override those knee jerk reactions, which we all have to protect ourselves. When the truth is I don't need to be protected. Mm. You know, we're engraved in God's palm. It says in Isaiah 49, we're already okay. I literally don't need to be defended. I need no defense, not because I'm special, but because I'm not, because it's true for all of us. God mm-hmm. has us in his hand. So I don't need to defend myself. I've already been justified. God has already declared that I'm good in his sight. So I can go from that place. Then I can slow down long enough and ask God to help me see Gwen through his eyes, not through my fearful tag playing, defending myself, just seeing you as a pain in my neck eyes, which are so not worth it. I mean, I'm not worthy of me or her, but I want to see her through God's eyes. This amazing person has been given to me as the greatest gift in my life who works so hard to take care of me. That's who she actually is. And so if she says something a little harsh to me and, you know, she grew up in a family where harshness was sort of the norm and she has worked her tail off to get better at that. And I give her so much credit for that. And once in a while, it still comes out harsh because that's how things go. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, so if she ever does say something harsh to me, I can feel all my old trigger reactions, but I I need to ask God to help me become a second responder, to choose not my first response, but my second one. When I look at Gwen, I remember how important she is, how precious she is to me, how important she is to God, and then I say, and that felt a little harsh. I'm still going to name what happened, but I don't have to be mean about it. I don't have to make her the bad one, and I don't have to say, I don't have to be mean to her. I'm just going to tell her, that felt harsh to me. That's what happened to me. And that she's, because I was graceful and said it that way, she's very likely to be able to say, oh, you know what, it probably did come out harsh. I'm really sorry. Here's what I meant to say. Great. So becoming a second responder means I still feel those same old knee-jerk tag playing reactions. I really don't think that ever changes. Mm -hmm. But I understand now, if I can give God two or three seconds to work with me, (laughs) to remember who who Gwen actually is, or to see that person in front of me for who they are, not just that pain in my neck, but a real person who God cares about who's really important to me, and then respond... Well, see, I'm not going to do that same old argument. We are not going to have that same old interaction again because I'm no longer focused on defending myself and making sure I'm not it. I'm focused on wanting to tell the truth in a way that's loving to the person who's standing in front of me. Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly, see, we're going to have a qualitatively different conversation. Yeah, Glenn, do I hear you correct? when uh, What I'm hearing you say is the argument that you're having with her would be the pain in the neck, not the person. Right. But I was I was wondering if some people might be hearing that you were talking about this pain in the neck. Well, see, that's referring how we, to her. Remember, I said no, no, no. Remember, I said when we get caught up in our fear, we're self-centered. We don't see the other person, and so instead of seeing Gwen in all of her glory and all that she actually is, mm-hmm. I see it through these wrong eyes. Like you're a pain. Well, she's not a pain. She's amazing. You know what I mean? I I see her so wrongly. <laughs> Like through my very human, caught up in all myself and defending myself eyes, I see such a distorted view of her that it's not even, not even close to the truth. Yeah. And I need to let, I need to slow down long enough for God to remind me of who she actually is before I start talking, because otherwise all the words I say will be the wrong words. Yeah. For all the wrong reasons. And God will show up every time, won't He? Oh, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. God turns out loves my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Wants me to treat her great. <laughs> Mm-hmm. cares about me, wants me to be happy. Well, if I say bad words to her, she's not happy, I'm not happy, the relationship's going bad, everybody's unhappy. There's literally no upside. Yeah. Glenn, let's talk about wrong beliefs. Right. Now, um, so I talked about how there are two common sources of our you know, bad patterns when we're getting those arguments. One is that we play tag, and one, the second one is that we get triggered sometimes. Um, and anytime I have a reaction that's way too big, you can be pretty sure that I got triggered on some really old thing. Like, let's say I, I did get brought up by thinking nobody really cares about me. Okay. So I keep my thoughts to myself all the time. I don't share them until finally something happens that shoves me over the edge. And now I start talking about why I'm mad about what just happened. Except what comes out is not just that I'm mad about that thing, but the 17 things that happened before that that I didn't talk about. And the other people are left thinking, what the heck happened? Mm-hmm. 
And now they are not loving to me because they feel so overrun, which just makes me think, see, nobody cares about me. And that got that really vicious cycle going there where I believe nobody cares about me, so I don't speak up. So then when I do speak up, it's too harsh. People are startled. They're not caring. And I just think, see, they don't care about me. I got that vicious cycle where I have this belief which leads to certain behaviors which trigger reactions in the other people that just confirm my belief. And that belief literally starts driving my life. And we all have some really, really old beliefs from growing up that are really, really driving us in ways we might or might not understand. But I can promise you, if you're having one of those arguments with somebody in your life, you're either playing tag and or you got triggered really hard by a belief that you have from your growing up time. Sure. And that belief drives our behavior way more than we think it might. That's a feature film that runs in your brain, doesn't it? Yes. And, um, and if I'm not careful, that feature film takes over my mouth, as James pointed out in chapter right. 3. How can you, same tongue that prays of God, be used to curse that people are made in God's image? What? what? Right. But that belief takes us over and starts talking, and mm. it's really, really painful. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that God's been really working with me on is healing some of my old traumas. And there's a lot of them growing up, as I've talked about on the air before. Um, I got neglected and hurt and every day. So... Um, and God has really been bringing that up in me. And it's been really hard. I've been getting triggered all the time. But I get now that God is bringing those memories up because if I pretend I don't have those memories, they can't be healed. And when Jesus said the truth will set you free, I think, right, even if the truth is really hard. Like with that abused kid who said, well, but my dad was abused himself. I think, no, no, no. The truth will set you free. Mm-hmm. My dad was hurtful to me. I love my dad. I want good for him. And he did things that were hurtful for me. And just standing in the truth of that is what actually sets us free. That's where forgiveness starts. That's where release happens. That's where release from captivity and transformation happens. So I was hurt in so many ways, and God's just bringing them up for me, not because I want to relive them because they were painful, but because God wants to actually heal them. And before they can be healed, I have to acknowledge that they happened. So more and more these days, I just walk around and one of those bad flashbacks comes to me like they were coming almost continuously to me today. And I need to just stop and think, yep, that did happen. Yep, that was really hard. Mm-hmm. And I can feel God's gentle presence around me when I'm stopping and talking to him about, yep, that happened. That was really hard. And I feel his gentle presence around me and I know it's going to be okay. And I've just been doing that continuously today because so many of those memories have been coming up. Mm-hmm. And those triggers, they drive a lot of our behavior. Glenn, what about some of these triggers that are truly misunderstandings? Well, see, they all are. I, okay. See, we, we come to these beliefs as kids, and kids are very accurate observers. So they see what they see, and they see it with great, painfully clear clarity. But they're kids, so they have black and white thoughts, and they think the world revolves around them. So let's say I have a dad who's mostly an okay guy, but sometimes gets angry and says bad things. And I'm a black and white kid. I see that happen. But I don't think, oh, my dad's a pretty good guy, but mostly once in a while he gets wound up. I think men are mean. Very black and white thinking. So I grew up avoiding men and not having great male relationships because I secretly think men are mean. Mm-hmm. And because I'm self-centered, because every little kid is, I think men are mean to me. And so I avoid relationships with guys because my belief is men are mean to me. And unless I start challenging that belief, unless I see that I have it and start challenging it and developing guy, relationships with guys that have depth and meaning to them, that that belief will keep running my life. Mm-hmm. And I will have repeated conversations over and over again because that belief drives me. So I'm always looking for data that quote-unquote proves that I'm right, that men are mean, can't trust them. And well, you'll, yeah. you'll hear me saying that sentence a hundred times in a year because that's a belief I have and it comes out at those hard times. And that just creates those repeated interactions. So we need a quick playing tag and we need to let God heal those parts of us that have been hurt. Again, no judgment. That little kid didn't do anything to deserve that. So I didn't deserve to have that person be mean to me, so I don't want to go there. But I just want to acknowledge that that happened, that I didn't make that up, that I have that thought for a reason, and the guy asked God to help me let go of that thought and replace it by things that are more true, which is that I have tons of people in my life who are incredibly graceful and caring to me. Mm-hmm. A great hour. Glenn, thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention, helping us to see our repeated, unresolved arguments that we're having in a fresh way. Don't play tag. Learn to become a second responder and be careful of your triggers and your wrong beliefs that are living in your head because they will bring about a bad response. Right, every time. All right. So thank you for that 
carry that takeaway. I've gotten a brown paper bag I can take home with me, and I can sort that on the like kitchen it. table, All right. and I can look at it and, and review it again. Dr. Glenn Pickering has been my guest. You can go to his website, drglennpickering.com. He offers a lovely uh, opportunity to talk to him for 20 minutes on the telephone, no strings attached. If you would like to make an appointment to do that, you can arrange that on his email. Go to drglennpickering.com. And you will uh, get a lot out of 20 minutes. So that's a very generous offer he gives us here at Faith Radio. That's all the time we have. Have a great night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.